I mean, Rome was kind of like back to normal in a lot of a lot of places. I'm sure that other people aren't necessarily there, but uh, I'm getting pretty 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 much back to normal here. Uh, we'll let people, of course, filter in. But uh, I'd like to kind of start with just getting getting the temperature in the room, talking to people about kind of where they are and, uh, you know, the, finding out what's happened, you know, whether or not you have pot water and whether or not you have power. I'll go ahead and start there. The uh, I've got. We had about 30 hours, 32 hours or so without power. And of course, it was on that really cold night, like a lot of people. And we when it finally got warm enough. We've found out we had a burst pipe so we got that uh we got that taken care of on sunday somebody came by from church a friend of mine from church and uh because i whereas i knew how to to fix copper pipe i didn't have supplies and boy you can't find supplies anywhere i had some uh i had some solder but you know you can't use uh electrical solder for uh plumbing because of the lead content so yeah, it was just I, I was waiting for somebody to come rescue me and uh that's one of the things I wanted to talk to talk to the meetup about, see if anybody had similar experiences, any ideas for apps that we could do to make things better. But uh, the, the punchline was, is that, you know, we, we got, we got through it just like everybody else did. I remember the uh, Tuesday morning, I went out to check the roads to see how bad they were because they were still iced over at that time. And my neighbors had uh, jumped in their car and slept in their car. They just had the car running all night long, because they, they didn't have any other way to get any kind of heat. And uh, that, that works if you have a full tank of gas, I guess. And that's that's how they stayed warm overnight. So in the room, uh, what, what were your thoughts? How, how did you do? Are you back to normal? You got water? You got power? What's up? Got water. Got power now. We lost water <clears throat> in the middle of it. We we're, I guess, yep. out for about a day and a half. And then it went up and down and up and down and up and down. Yeah, lost heat because I had the brilliant idea of boiling water in my house to warm it up, only to find out it uh, produced a lot of condensation up in the attic, which turned into water and fried out my heating board. So we got it's a it's my fun story, but uh, fortunately we had a uh, AC guy come out on Tuesday, which was a miracle in and of itself, and then uh, had the part and had it replaced. So. Uh, that's my fun story. I, I hosed my heating and got it up in, in, in my first batch of power. So we got to the point where we were gaining power enough to warm the house up to a comfortable level. And so so when it went down, it wasn't, you know, deathly cold. Yeah, I, I can appreciate the try something and it doesn't necessarily work. I did a little bit of that myself. So when well, no, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> It, it fogged up all the windows, and it did. It did heat it up at least about five degrees, and so uh, I, just, I just found out how how effective it was to my attic and my and my and okay. my heating system afterwards. Yeah, I can imagine. Ah, oh, man. And what were the the things that I had done that I hadn't necessarily thought through? It took me a while to figure out that the pipe that burst was the hot water feed to my washing machine. And I could have, you know, I could have turned off the, the hot water heater and had water flowing, you know, at least to the cold water part of the house. So living and learning there. How about, how about the rest of you guys? Uh, you got water and power? Yeah, um, we yeah. had we had lost water in the in the kitchen for a while. It froze up or something. And uh, we, and we lost Internet for about 24 hours. So working from home didn't work too well. So had to yeah. take a vacation there, but we did have power and heat. So, um, but a lot of my coworkers didn't have it for three days. So it was really tough um, for them, I, I imagine. So, yeah, but we were, we got lucky. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's actually something I wanted to talk to the room about was the, uh, what this makes you think about when we're talking about, um, working from home because you know clearly there are some limitations to that consider that yeah originally i'm from minnesota and uh i i had two jobs where i'd work from home and uh i learned on a power outage one time there that the you know 
the in, the cables on a different a different uh, system. So as long as you have power to run the cable modem, you know you could still do work from home. So I put a UPS on my uh, on my cable modem and my Wi-Fi, you know, my Wi-Fi thing. So if I had, you know, and, and you know, UPSs are built for computers to run them not very long, but you know, right. running a, a, a just a, a Wi-Fi router and a cable modem, you could run that for a good two hours with that. So, hmm. unfortunately, in here I have uh, fiber, and I think the Wi-Fi is over here um, to my left, and the the fiber comes in the house and gets powered in the garage. So there's no way I could put one UPS on both. But uh, you know, but that's a good strategy if if you know, you're on cable modem and they're both in the same spot. You can put a UPS, you know, to keep the, at least the, the, you know, Wi-Fi going if if you need to, but uh, obviously people had a lot worse to worry about than just not being online. So it wasn't a, a big deal, but uh, when I was in Minnesota, I mean, we still had power, we still had, or we still had uh, heating and stuff, but the, um, the power went out and we just had to, you had to, you just went offline all of a sudden and you were like, "Uh Oh, <laughs> so and you were in the middle of a meeting or whatever, whatever you may, you know, whatever it was. So. And yeah. UPS is on the, uh, on the internet devices is definitely uh, a must have. I have a, I have the same in my house. Now mine won't last long, but it'll allow, allow for a graceful shutdown because while everything else is shut down, nobody's talking to it. And so Therefore, it can shut down gracefully because I got a PF Sense router on an old Dell computer. So, but yeah, definitely get the UPS on the uh, internet devices. That is, that is a must-have. Nice, nice lesson learned there. So, for the for the folks, I'm I have an AT and T wireless router, and so I'm on. You know, I'm not on uh, uh, cable uh, internet. I'm just on AT and T's high-speed internet and even when i ran power to it from a inverter that i had my camping equipment no connectivity i assume that there's uh there's other uh electronic devices that are essentially providing that signal and they were offline like the rest of the houses were is that does anybody on the uh, call yeah, know enough yeah. about the yeah i think that's why we lost internet at our at our place um i have hmm. frontier fiber and I think, I mean, we had power the whole time, but, um, you know, maybe the substation that had, that runs that I run to probably didn't. Um, I mean, we took a little drive, uh, around here and, you know, all the power was out neighborhoods, street lights. I mean, you know, it was, it was dark everywhere. So yeah. that's, a, you're right. That's assuming that the uh, AT&T has power and, and all that stuff happens, but, um, but, uh, you know, I think this was unique that so many of Houston was, was shut down. And I think that, you know, even, even the businesses and, and, and things had power outages. So you, you weren't guaranteed, you know, power, even if you had, you know, even if you have powered your thing, which I commend you, that's a, that's a good, that's a good thought, you know, get your inverter, run your, run your, 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 your internet, but, I didn't even think of that. I, that would have been <laughs> that would have been another one. So that's that's another thing I'm going to take away from this. So I'll let I'll let Ryan go. Yeah, what do you think, Ryan? Yeah, sorry guys, I was putting the dogs away. Man, I, <laughs> so I'm here in the Heights, and uh, I'm three years right. in Houston, and I'm still kind of learning all of all of the fun things. And where I'm at right now in the Heights is it's older house that's been remodeled and. I learned that that means insulation is not great. Uh, so my house, I was out without power or water Monday through Thursday. And uh, it was brutal. Yeah. Whoa. Like you, had, you, had, you had no power for three days? No. Wow. How cold did it get in your house? Were you able to measure oh, it? The first, from 6 a.m. when it went out on Monday morning, by 11, we were at 37 degrees. And I was like this you, you can't do any like it's too cold uh yeah, so do i was very fortunate in that like i had a very close friend who lived in cyprus and they had power but if it weren't for them i didn't have a gener. I, I called everywhere to see if i could get a generator and of course like last minute no shot right 
So it, it makes you grateful for the friends that you have and, and kind of the people that are there for you when you need them. And it, it makes you want to be there when they might need you. So it's kind of a, a good experience in that regard. So. Dang. That is brutal. That's yeah. But I'm not, it's like, it's, it's weird to be kind of like, cause so many people had it way worse. Right. So it, and That's all true. things considered, it worked out for me. It wasn't fun. It was kind of a nightmare driving back and forth. And I don't have like, there's nothing that I can like dial into to see like, oh, my Porsche light is on or something like that. And I'm still kind of meeting people in the neighborhood uh, now more so because of this situation, because uh, yeah. being able to text somebody would have been nice. But mm. yeah, a lot of people had it way worse. And so it's tough for me to like, I don't want to like feel too bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I agree with you because there's so many things that I feel really blessed that I had food, I had water, I had a stove, even though I didn't have power, it was cold. I had so many things that I consider myself, this isn't so bad, you know? So, so yeah, that perspective is definitely a, a good thing. Yeah, and I had a buddy of mine who I guess his sister had spent like eight grand on a built-in generator when she built her home a few years back. And I mean, it's one of those things, especially living in Houston with hurricanes and things like that. It kind of makes you wonder, like, maybe, uh, maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> he was telling me that within a matter of seconds, she was back online and no issues. <sighs> Jeez. This was a huge conspiracy to really boost the generator uh, industry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of those ironic things I have, uh, I have a nice generator that I bought for Harvey and it's still in the box. I never had to take the dang thing out. And I had until like the week before that darn storm, I had 40 gallons of gas in my garage. I used it all the, the week before that darn storm. So I went into the storm with a brand new generator, no gas. And of course, you couldn't get anywhere. You couldn't go anywhere to get gas. It's just <laughs> just, yeah, just bad luck and timing with yeah. when you used it. Man. Dang it. <laughs> yeah, how did, how did you end up using 40 gallons of gas just in your lawnmower? Or just just or, in the yeah, cars. Just, just in the cars. put it in the cars. Yeah, it, did, it actually, you can use 40 gallons of gas in Houston in no time. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, When you when you got the generator, did you get it wired into your house? I heard I heard that's separate uh or different. Yeah, yeah. Interested in getting that wiring done, even if I don't have a generator, just in case I get one or we have a you know something in the future. Well, yeah, sure. There there's natural gas generators. I think that's the eight thousand dollar option that Ryan was talking about. And uh and I I'm on the same wavelength you are there, Ryan. I was thinking about that myself not too long ago, but I thought, yeah, we never lose power for that long. <laughs> we hadn't until then. And there's gonna that's gonna be a consistent theme in this PowerPoint is it was fine until it wasn't. And this is typically the case in, in these kind of extreme situations, which is clearly what we ran into on this one. So interesting stories, guys. I, I'm glad that uh I'm glad I asked because you know it it helps to talk about these kind of things. And uh, if anybody is still out there looking for help or or looking for something, maybe we can find a way to hitch them up. Like, like I said, I I got my pipe fixed. I, I was on, I, we could talk about this probably a little bit later, but I was on every plumber's wait list, you know, and the nearest uh, appointment I had was somewhere in March, March 22nd, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my mother-in-law was on Facebook. Like she, she likes to be on Facebook, you know, it's like where old people go now. And so she's, she's post, she's looking around on Facebook and one of the people in Houston that she knows had four leaks or something or 16 leaks or something crazy like that. And they got their pipes fixed and they had posted something and she had seen that and she knew that we were out. And so she kind of wound up, she wound up getting the information to us and somebody from my church saw that post and they called me because we had played in a band together back in golly the late nineties. And, uh, he's like, Hey, I got copper. And he came over and he fixed my darn pipe. And, you know, you, you think about this kind of things and imagine, just imagine a situation so bizarre that Facebook actually is useful for something. 
<laughs> that's that's Yuri. That's Winter Storm Yuri. I'm not a big fan of Facebook. Hope hope I'm not uh, uh, insulting anybody's uh, sensibilities there. No. But, oof. <laughs> it begs the question, though, right? If you look at the way that, like, ERCOT, for example, there's hmm. no reason why we shouldn't have visibility into, like, energy consumption and, like, have a better way of, like, insight and preparation. I mean, it's like if we can build a platform that connects me to someone who lives in Africa <laughs> or wherever, like, there's no reason that... You know what I mean? It, it just seems, right. yeah. and that's what that's the exciting thing, right? Is like these moments hopefully present an opportunity for companies and people, and for us to evolve. And that you have to have hope in that, right? Right. But but you have to you have to think about this. So, uh, Matt, I heard you say that you're from Minnesota. I'm from Nebraska. So, like, you know, there was it wasn't that cold last week, but we lost <laughs> power on Sunday. And we were, I live in Austin or north of Austin, and we were having some of the rolling stuff, but we would be out for like six hours and back on for 30 minutes. But we lost our, uh, our heat pump and we're all electric. So we didn't have any, you know, so the heat pump went out, but in the, in the, uh, the, the furnace that's in the attic, it has a little heat strip. So it would blow some warm air out. And we found that our master bedroom was like the warmest place in the house. So, you know, when it was sunny, we'd open the windows and, and get that in there and, and get all that going. But it kind of reminds me, though, of, you know, I don't know if you guys have boats or like boats or whatever, but I, you know, own several. And you winterize your boat, whether you live here, or you live in Minnesota, right? And it sucks because it costs like 500 bucks to do it. I've actually learned how to do my, do it myself now, but um you know, the first few times and, you know, every year you get it done, you know, in like September, October, and then you don't use it until it warms up. And I think the there were so many people that didn't want to spend that money to protect, you know, the, the resources, which, you know, that's just, you know, kind of penny wise and pound foolish. And I think they're going to get beat up for it pretty bad. But I know, you know, I've lived down here long enough, you know, it, it gets cold every now and again. I think this was probably the longest snap for a, for a bit from yep. maybe since the eighties, but it's not, you know, it's not unprecedented. It's, you know, it's a natural phenomenon that just happens. You just don't think it's going to happen to you, which I, Dan, I think back to your point was you learned a lot of stuff and, and a lot of people in my neighborhood kind of came together because I sold my, you know, my, I traded my snow shovel for a heat shovel and, you know, I was without all the, all the stuff that I would have been out, you know, cleaning, you know, yeah. sidewalks and driveways and stuff like that. I don't think there was a, a scoop shovel to be had, you know, any, you know, anywhere around. And I was like, Ryan, I was trying to find a generator. I thought I found some at, uh, at, a Oh, not, a, it was like a, it's like a, a supply store, a tool supply store, safe Harbor down in Houston. They, they said that they had some, I was, I was fixing to drive to Houston one day to get a generator because, wow, <laughs> you know, you know, just so I could, you know, I could have like a warm, like a fan on. Or, or whatever, but we lost, I'm, you know, I have AT&T like you do, Dan. And that was, you know, that was went out. Um, I have AT&T cellular and it would go, it would be on sometimes and then off. Like, so, right. You know, right. all of a sudden we'd be like, you know, non-communicata yeah. for, for a good bit. Yeah. I have a, a Verizon phone from work. If I didn't have that Verizon phone, I'd had no connectivity. AT&T kept throttling everybody back. Right. And we could get, I could get no bandwidth. It was yeah. super depressing. Well, I want to, I'm going to jump in. I love where we're going with this and I want to continue that. Let's jump into the slideshow because that's where I want to go. I want to talk about, well, what do we think as, you know, as engineers and professionals, but I will ask one question. This was, this is another thing I learned. Uh, do y'all remember the scene from Apollo 13 where they ask, well, how much power do we have to play with after the command module? you know, had problems. And the guy points at the coffee pot and he says about enough to run that for six hours or whatever it was. Remember that line? Yeah. Do you have any idea how many Watts it takes to run a standard coffee pot? Cause I have that, that power inverter. <laughs> if I connect it to my battery directly to a car battery, I get 500 Watts. And th that was the only reason I had any kind of connectivity at all. Cause I was able to recharge devices. I was charging devices, right, right. Carbon battery, 500 Watts. And I, and we had every device I had was plugged into that dang thing. We were charging it. I went to plug in a coffee pot, 
cut the the thing just cut off. I, you know, redid it. I would imagine it change. takes a lot because you it's have two 12, heating elements. Twelve hundred watts for wow. a coffee pot. I, isn't that amazing? I did not know that. Well, I mean, I guess you, when you think about it, you have to you have two heating elements. One, you have the plate that heats yeah, the, right. the the carafe up, and then another one, which is probably the one that draws the most, is somehow. I don't know how it does this stuff because coffee makers are amazing. They can heat water to a point that's hot enough to brew coffee extremely quickly and on the fly yep. until it's done. So that probably consumes an incredible amount of energy just to make that heating element function and get the water hot enough. I don't think the yep. plate is probably that much that, that heavy on the consumption, but it's probably the not. brewing process that is. Yep, probably not. <laughs> but yeah, 1200 watts. I was shocked. I thought I had a way to get a fresh cup of coffee. I had to stick with the instant. <laughs> anyway, all the things were bad. Now, I don't know if you know what this picture is, but the picture on the splash screen here is of a uh, hotel pool. This is somewhere in Houston, and this is a, a pool in one of the uh, Houston uh, hotels. And of course, the water probably was frozen solid at this point, but covered with snow, you know, winter storm, Yuri. Uh, let's get rolling here on the presentation. Where am I? go there it is so you know quick disclaimer my intent here is not to you know people died in this thing and my my intent's not to belittle or any of that kind of stuff and, I, and i'm you know i tend to be kind of jovial you know i tend to make a, a lot of wise cracks and i've got a real dry sense of humor i'm trying to dim that down a shade for this because there's serious stuff that's, that's that happened here so i just want you to understand that's not the the point the point is is that I saw an opportunity here to talk about retrospectives because there are going to be a lot of accusations and a lot of people trying to find blame. And that's not what retrospectives are. Retrospectives are all about accountability. And so I think you'll see that the, the, my heart in this is really about how accountability works because it's a two way street. So I thought, okay, let's gather some you know pictures here and remind us of what, what has happened. And this is just, you know, a lot of swimming pools there, iced over this crazy, uh, uh, apparently somebody's apartment there with the uh, dripping icicles from the fan, uh, a hot tub here in the upper left hand corner, a, an aquarium frozen solid, the icicles coming from the toilet. Just that awful. seems a little extreme. I mean, that's a lot of cold to freeze a yeah. aquarium solid yeah. and to be able to stand on a pool like that. That's cold. Yeah. That's a lot of cold. And cold right. for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Car wash there. The upper right is Galveston. That's Galveston of all places. In the upper lower uh, right there is uh, Houston. That's a, one of the Houston roadways. I'm not sure which one. But uh, this is not stuff we're used to seeing. Some poor person's apartment or house. I guess it's a house. Lower left here, this is kind of funny. There's uh, somebody didn't have any uh, sand or anything, so they put grits on their stairs, and that worked. Grit, grits were... Oh, this is only traction. applicable in the South. <laughs> this is only applicable in the South. Are, are, those, are, are those instant grits? <laughs> I don't know. What's the uh, capacity of the... You know, you got to get a certain kind of grits. But uh, somebody's uh, all-weather tent in there. I've heard a lot of, a lot of people were pulling out their all-weather gear, trying to stay warm. Okay, so setting the stage here, we got our illustrious uh, mayor there, Governor Abbott, or uh, uh, Governor, Governor Abbott. And uh, so let's say that we've got these two winter storms, Uri and Viola, and that's my understanding of those were the storms that, that hit us. And they swept across widespread damage. We know that story, right? Uh, and so we're going to construct a narrative here. In response to public concern, the governor of Texas, Texas, Greg Abbott, has demanded an investigation. Of course, that's what you do when you're governor. You demand an investigation. So ERCOT and Energy Reliability Council of Texas, and I want you to keep an eye on the word reliable because we're going to be talking about that a lot in this uh, in this slide deck, because uh, that, I think, is the key. Uh, ERCOT has identified the problem as being in the complex domain and seeks DevOps agile expertise. As we all know, the complex domain of the Kinefin framework, Kinefin, Sinefin, Kinefin, whatever they're, however you pronounce that, that's where agile uh, methodology or methodologies or frameworks thrive, is in that complex domain. 
And due to its expertise and energy and its strong Houston DevOps meetup, of course, right? Uh, Erica has asked Houston for help. And so, so I, well, why, why DevOps here? Why DevOps? And so uh, th- th- I went and I said, okay, you know, what is DevOps? And I went to these various sites, you know, Amazon, IBM, Azure, Microsoft, and Gremlin. And I, I kept running into that word, reliable, right? Reliable is part of what DevOps does. And, you know, we, we talk about, and if, if you, uh, in my role, I'm usually that, that injector of uh, the disruptive technology. And I come, the people hire me because I've got expertise in this area and I'm supposed to come into an organization and show them how to do things better, right? And, and we always know how, that, how well that works, right? But uh, we always talk about the speed of DevOps. We always talk about the response of this, but we rarely talk about the reliability. That's we're doing that when we do DevOps practices, right? We're trying to deliver software that works reliable. And so that is why I'm thinking, okay, Energy Reliability Council of Texas, that's what ERCOT stands for. DevOps is all about reliability. So benefits of DevOps off the top, we often talk about the virtues of DevOps, better agility, improved velocity, coordination, with operations, right? These are all things that would be wonderful to have if we had a, a particularly thorny situation coming at us. Better balance of stability and new features, reliable, again, reliable delivery of service, better customer satisfaction. There are a lot of dissatisfied customers. I don't know if y'all saw, uh, apparently the uh, somebody at Gritty, one of the uh, retail operators in Texas, literally told their customers, uh, please go to another uh, company. There was customers calling and complaining because gritty that uh, they had some challenges with their billing, some very high billing, but uh, better customer satisfaction is supposed to be a result of DevOps. So, so you're beginning to see, yeah, there's there's a, there's definitely a, an application of DevOps to this particular problem. And so we come to the blameless retrospective, and the point is, is that when you're doing these kind of things, it is blameless, and that that's. That's hard. It's hard to do. Retrospectives, in my uh, experience, are the first thing we stop doing. And if we are doing them, we rarely do them well. I remember like the first time I tried to do uh, Scrum, it took us months before I came out of a retrospective and I thought, yes, that retrospective worked because there's such a high level of trust that's required and such a high level of honesty that's required and people can't be holding things taking things personally and all that kind of thing. So that is the blameless retrospective, that that trusting, that ability to criticize somebody or be criticized, that is where the magic of, uh, of things like DevOps and things like Agile and Scrum actually manifests. So we want to really do this right. We know that it's an, this is basically founded on the empirical method. Empirical method requires data. So let's talk about some of that data behind this storm. So I went out to a, a number of sites and pulled in some stats, and we'll talk about that in a sec here. But the ideal format for a retrospective, and I know I'm preaching the choir. I know you people know this, but uh, we're, we are recording this, so we'll have, a, we'll have something to show uh, other people and to point them to. This is the way that retrospectives apply. So three things, celebrate successes which, you know, think about that in relation to what just happened. Discuss the issues and irritants. We've got plenty of those, right? And identify the actions. So it's what we did right, what we could have done better, and, you know, what we're going to do to fix things. Everybody knows that, right? So got a couple stats here on, uh, I just gathered various pieces of information uh, from places. I've got those in the uh, slide deck. I'll post the slide deck and to the uh, to the meetup page there. But uh, 170 million Americans being placed under various winter weather alerts across the country. 120 million of those were placed under winter storm warnings or ice warnings by the National Weather Service. Caused the blackouts for 9.7 million people in the U.S. and Mexico. The blackouts were the largest in the U.S. since the Northeast blackout of 2003. And I believe that was the polar vortex or was that? I don't remember if that was the polar vortex, but uh, there were some. This is clearly a big event, 15 years. Uh, The storm also brought severe destructive weather to southeast states. On February 16th, there were 20 direct 
fatalities and 13 indirect. By February 19th, the death toll had risen to at least 70, including 58 people in the United States and 12 people in Mexico. So serious, serious impact. We've got one of two. This is the second page of it. So the storm started in the U.S. US Northwest. So darn you, Washington and Seattle. You send in your lousy weather down here. Within one week, uh, 11.1 inches of snow in Seattle. This was the largest since 1972. Uh, and I wanted to, to get some perspective, right? I wanted to say, okay, so what was the, what, what, how bad was it? You know, was it just a little bad or was it really bad? And so I think these stats indicate this is pretty bad. This is not something that we ran into every day. 9.4 inches in Portland. That's 1968, 9.9 inches in Boise and since 1996. And for the first time on record, the National Weather Service issued winter storm warnings for all 254 co- counties in the state. That's Texas. That's a, for the first time ever. February 16th alone, daily record lows were broken in Oklahoma City, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Little Rock. In the Oklahoma City there in Dallas, those were the second lowest all-time right, temperatures. And all-time low temperatures in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and the Hastings, Nebraska. So the, those places are certainly Nebraska, and, that, and that's the and that's the that's the warm spot in Nebraska. So, <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> that's the balmy uh, Hastings, Nebraska. Kent, pardon me. <laughs> that's the balmy Hastings, Nebraska. That's the, that's the balmy. Yeah, it's the balmy uh, south yeah. of the interstate on the way to Colorado. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, again, the, the point there is, I wanted to. It's all about data. When, when you're doing DevOps, if you don't have data, you can't, you shouldn't just go around just changing things because you don't know if you're doing any good. You don't know if you're making any kind of impact. We got to know what we're dealing with here. And what we're dealing with, with something like Tropical Storm Uri is clearly a significant event. It's not something that happens every day. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen like next month. We don't know, right? It's weather. So we come to the retrospective. What's the good? What's the bad? What do we need to change? So I, I started thinking about this and I would love your input on this. If anybody in here is thinking, yeah, we, we probably want to call this out as something that's good as well. But one of the things I noticed that uh, ERCOT did specifically, and, and for what it's worth for the people in the room, I spent some time as the uh, IT director for the, for the real-time desk systems at Direct Energy. We, we had the systems, I was in control of those systems that deployed the gas combined cycle power plants in the wind farms to the ERCOT grid. So I know I know a little bit at least enough to enough to know that I don't know enough about how hard and how complex this stuff is, and so I started thinking about that and, and prod some people that I know in those positions. And these were the three things that I came up with: we protected the power assets, and it was my understanding that we deliberately took the plants offline, and that was related to number two there: we're protecting the grid integrity. If you uh, are not careful, I don't, I don't know how many of y'all know about this, but you have to maintain an AC grid at a certain mega megahertz of a, a cycle time. And it's about 60 is my understanding. And so when I, when I was in the, uh, when I was in that real time room at direct energy, there was a digital display that was connected to the grid. It was always between, you know, 59.8 and 60.2 roughly. And it, it was always on And any time that got outside of that range, you were at risk of blowing out substations. If, in other words, if if we were not careful, if the ERCOT grid operators were not careful, we wouldn't have been down for a day or two. We would have been down for months, literally. Catastrophic blackout. We would have taken out substations and the whole nine yards. So there's there's the problem with the power assets were under considerable duress. They had to take those offline, but they also had to maintain the integrity of the grid or they would not have been able to dis- distribute power. They could they could generate it, but they couldn't distribute it. So these were things that they did that were well, well done. And the punchline was that at the worst, the, the stats are still coming in. They're starting to kind of settle, but 3.5 million homes in ERCOT were off, offline. By Thursday, they were back online for the most part. There's there a couple hundred thousand, I think, that were still lingering. And uh, that 3.5 million is 13% of all customers were offline. So within a couple of days, ERCOT had managed to restore power to a lot of those. And that you have to give them credit for that. They restored it, right? Uh, 
here we come to the bad. We come to the bad here. And like I said, jump in if you think, okay, well, we missed this good one or we missed this bad one. So entities tasked with maintaining the reliability of the Texas power grid failed in its primary objective. And I don't think that's too arguable. It failed. It's a reliability council. That's what ERCOT exists for is to deliver power reliably. It failed. And that's that has to be addressed honestly or we can't get better. Right. That's the that's the accountability. That's that's the retrospective. That's that level of trust. Right. And so uh, the, the punchline is Zircot did not adequately prepare, is, is what it sounds like. 70 people died. That's clearly a big problem. Of the 4 million who lost power across the southern states, 5 million in all the states, right? So 5 million total had lost power in the United States, 4 million just in the southern states, 3.5 million were in ERCOT. So it was colder to the north, it, but they didn't have the same kind of impact we did. There was something specifically wrong with ERCOT that we were impacted drastically by this event, right? I think that's kind of hard to argue. And the, uh, this fascinating last part, almost every faucet of ERCOT's power generation was impacted by the cold weather. The piles of coal froze, froze solid into chunks of ice. Ice blocked natural gas pipelines, wind turbine, turbines became iced over, and the, the nuclear power experienced weather-related issues because of the feed water systems. So literally everything was impacted. We were not winterized. This grid was not winterized. I think that's what Ken had mentioned. And uh, we were not ready for this. We did not prepare. So all that being said, I come up and I say, well, I, I think when you look at it, the preparation was a failure, but the response was well done. And so I talk a lot with my teams about this, that idea, that dangerous idea where if you're fast, you don't have to be careful, right? There's a level of when you're in DevOps and when you're doing software, if you can deploy fast, you don't have to be as careful. You know, you can put something out there and try and if it doesn't work and just push a button, deploy the next version. Okay. You're back to, back to normal. Right? So there's that idea of being fast. There's that idea of being careful and ERCOT didn't prepare. We responded well. I think we responded really well. And I, you know, if, if, uh, I know some spe specific people. I saw some things on LinkedIn from some of my former uh, uh, co-workers who one of them literally called the uh, the ERCOT people, the people that were maintaining the grid, deploying stuff, literally heroes for what they did and how they did it, because it, it would have been a bad news had we not uh, taken care of the grid from a long-term perspective. I, I so. have some questions. When, when would be a good time to ask some questions? I don't know it if just, this is the time. Just jump in. That's okay, good. Okay, because I'm you, you've said a lot of things, and so it's like I'm trying to assess where the problem is, what the breakdown was, because my understanding was we didn't have enough power going into the grid, but then you mentioned other things like they literally had to shut down power plants because the infrastructure could not take that much all at once. So like in, in, in trying to find a way to better prepare and understand this, where, where, okay. I'm trying to like, where did it really break down? It was, I mean, you can talk about like, okay, the coal froze over so they couldn't shovel it or, or, or the, the, the turbines froze up because they couldn't rotate. Okay. That that's kind of the narrative, but you, you brought in another variable that could have just exploded the whole grid. If all of a sudden everybody let it go, is, is it that the pipelines are too narrow because we, we burn through all kinds of power during the summer? So is it an, is, is infrastructure part of the problem? That is a good question. I'm not sure. I, I would anticipate that there's a, a number of things that have to be done at the plant to keep the plant running, right? So that would be so supply. We, yeah. And then there's also the ability of the uh, the... The grid has to know how much power to generate, right? And I, I think we, I think they got that estimate wrong. And when stuff started going offline, and they had no, they essentially had no backup. They had, they were over a barrel. They, they did not have the reserves they needed from other, from the other assets because they had considered that the assets were ready. You know, they were, they had always been ready. So. I would think there's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You know, you if you go online, James, what you'll find is a lot of people 
a lot of people talk and like the first thing that people started arguing about was, well, we relied too much on wind generation. And, you know, then it turns into this political thing and it's, you're not helping. Well, <laughs> you're it, not it sounds helping. like, it, it sounds like, okay, you could argue that, but that's not the only argument to be had. And so <laughs> I think, yeah. yeah, because I think it's important to understand the bigger picture because well, like, as you're going through this, I'm thinking of like, okay, what could be done? Okay, so my understanding yeah. is you have this grid that takes power in, all right? And so people are actually brokering that power. And so pe- power companies, providers, are saying, are, are they actually making a commitment that we are going to provide this much power at this time? And kind of like a contractual that's, obligation. Yeah, that's, okay? that's what's happening. And then, but there was no contingency plan if they weren't able to meet their commitment. We didn't have a backup plan to provide or, or an emergency, hey, we need to call in these companies or something to provide more so that there's yeah. not a, uh, uh, like the, kind of the 80-20 rule, like we only, we, we build up to 80% so that if we have 20% over that we can, somebody else can push it a little bit harder to provide and make up for that loss over there. Right, right. And I, I think, yeah, I'm getting way out over my skis here because I am an IT person after all, right? But it's my understanding what ERCOT does is it relies on the free market for that. And it's got it's got what amounts to offerings and products for the generators. So there, there's things like, there, there's a thing called Black Start. And then there's Baseload, right? So what you can do is you can say as a, as a power plant operator, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to tell ERCOT, okay, tomorrow I'm going to run my plant and I'm going to dump this much power onto the grid between these hours. And you're going to get paid for that. But seeing as it's like day ahead and it's kind of baseload stuff, you're going to get paid just a little bit. You can also essentially gamble, hold your generation in reserve, not put it into the day ahead market and wait and see what happens. And if there is a big need, they'll call for Black Start and you get a bunch of money for that. Because a Black Start means you've got a plant that's just sitting there. You fire it up and you start dumping power on the grid. So you're going to get paid a premium for that power because it's it's a quick yeah and, quick and you, they want they want the opportunity to gain that and that's that's yeah. great that's what it's there for yeah I think on the flip side of it is is we need to be able to project the needs yeah uh, okay so there's all these other variables and you know like an expert system that factors in temperature factors in precipitation factors in all these other variables to estimate. How much energy is people are people going to need now? Was that a problem? I, was, I don't know. That's actually I I did not find numbers on that, but because there's the, there's this balance of in and out, and that's why you know megawatts in needs to equal you know megawatts out kind of thing, yeah, and if those are imbalanced, you're pulling more in, out of the system than it has to offer, and then it shuts down, and you know bad things happen. But then that's why I asked about the infrastructure in order to, to transfer power from generator to home. Is there a breakdown there? And so, so that's kind of why I'm, we didn't, it wasn't really a transmission problem was my understanding. Okay. This was literally a load versus a generation problem. And then of course, once the, the load became too high, the grid, uh, frequency started dropping and then they had to pull things down or the, or the grid would have uh, suffered a catastrophic blackout been terrible. So they had, they had to act. So, so what's part, what's part of the problem, like what Kent had mentioned about, well, you need to weatherproof your boats yeah. out here, you know, you got a bunch of dumb rednecks in their boats and don't want to do it because they, <laughs> they don't want to spend the time, money or energy to do it. They just want to go out fishing in March and April when, when the fishing's good, they don't care about February and January. Sure. So they don't, they don't properly invest in the preventative measures that would destroy their boat is, I mean, obviously in hindsight, you can say, yeah, we should have, would have, could have done that. But is that realistically a factor? That, and that's really where the battle's going to rage. That That's a great question. And I wish I had a better answer. When I look at what's going on right now, I, I look at the fact that that ERCOT got it up and running and stabilized pretty quickly. And there, 
clearly we have we have an event. So I, I I was talking to my daughters about what had happened, and I said, okay, look, I'm going to go to the store. So I'm going to go to the store. I probably should take a, or I might want to take a snake bite kit with me, because there are snakes in Houston and they're poisonous, and I might get bit. So I might want to take a snake bite kit. I might also want to take an umbrella. It might rain. Might also take a spare tire because, you know, I might have. And so I can do this all day, right? I can come up with five semi trailers worth of crap that I got to take with me to go to the store because I don't want to run into something that's unforeseen, right? And so that is at, is at least part of what's going on with ERCOT. Now, you have some, we have some serious considerations when it comes to wind. And I think, you know, the, uh, this is another one that's like way out over my skis, right? But wind generation in Texas, it's, it was my understanding. I like the guy that ran the 24 hour desk, he said, you know, wind's great. But the problem is, is that it blows during the day, during it, it blows, blows most consistently during the day, during the winter in West Texas. So where people are not and when we don't need power, that's when the winds are reliable. It's, it's, it has great. It has great qualities, but not for Texas, right? So you need to find a, an energy source that has the right qualities for your load. And our load is, you know, eight to five pretty much during the day of uh, summer, which is when the wind's not blowing. But solar's there, right? Solar's there. So, so all of these these uh, energy sources have their qualities and they have things that are good. So when people say, well, you relied too much on, on wind or you didn't rely enough on wind or, you know, you're, you didn't winterize your grid, everybody can be right. But that ultimately the, the problem of managing power is, is fiendishly complex. And people, of course, anybody that comes forward and says, well, you just do this and it's fixed. Well, yeah, that's peddling simple solutions to a complex problem. And those those people are called politicians, they, and they're not called engineers because you just can't do it that way. So uh, those, are, but those are all great questions. We're, well, how do well? How in the world do we fix this? How do we get a better forecast? Yeah, and, it's like the politicians calling you out for not bringing a snake bite kit. <laughs> well, one you of the should have had that. Should have been standard issue <laughs> snake bite kit. Ah, uh, yeah, because you know there's there's snakes. One of the things that's interesting about the grid, I don't know how many of y'all know this, but it is its own kind of separate thing. There. The only way that our grid connects with other grids is through direct current interconnects. We have DC interconnects with the other grids, and there's only a couple of them. And so you can export and import power onto the ERCOT grid from the other grids, but it is, it's pretty expensive and you wind up losing a lot in the transfer, apparently. And they did that on purpose. So, of course, so what happens is like when you had the uh, blackout in the Northeast that took out the entire uh eastern seaboard at one time well that's what happens when you connect your grids and somebody has a problem and it's not properly maintained and those those blackouts start rolling through and you could lose the entire united states but ERCOT would still be up that's what that means that those dc interconnects protect ERCOT. the entire united states could go down with a catastrophic failure ERCOT would still be up so there's a lot of people saying well we, we need to connect our grid with the other grids well that's that is a solution but it comes at a cost, right? <laughs> there's a reason why you don't connect systems together. And then there's a reason why, why you do. So all these, all these solutions have been floated and I've heard them all. And I just, ah, oh, geez, no. <laughs> you know? I think what if, what if like not, not expecting perfection, right? At the end of the day, we're all humans and, and make mistakes. And it, it, this is, like you said, a very complex thing, I think, to sit here and say, okay, how can we make sure this never happens again? I think that's not a really fair request. I think more so it's like, how can we better communicate and, and make this scenario less catastrophic than it, than it might be? And yeah. that could be like, okay, we know that these areas are, they have a high propensity based on where they're at and based on whatever, metrics they have that they're going to be impacted maybe more heavily so we like contact these folks and let them know hey where you're at like you have a large chance that it's going to be pretty bad maybe you should take these measures so yeah like like pow power down for a couple of hours versus a couple of days because people can put up with their power being down for a couple of hours and sure they're not going to like it they're going to moan and groan but then when it comes back on 
they're going to go back about their business. Because uh, that, that, that's part of the risk of playing the game. You're going to lose power for some time, you know. Well, yeah, think, think about it this way, guys. Uh, if what's really happening is when you walk into a room and you turn on a light, theoretically there is somebody somewhere at a power generation station who just turned up his power a little bit to accommodate that light bulb there are 30 million people in texas now, you, you, when you when you draw power somebody has to supply that power you can't store the stuff now you know you, your battery's right great yeah th that's going to really be a solution and again it's a it's a a, a resource you can't store so theoretically, literally every time you turn on a light, somebody's turning up a power source. There's 30 million people in the is, state. Is that not automated? Well, it is. But and of course, you know, there's I mean, a lot still, of, I know there's management, but it's still on, you know. Well, that's why I'm saying the 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 megahertz would fluctuate between 59.8 and six. So, you know, there was a little bit of give there, and the grid is designed to handle that give. So uh, we could engineer the grid to be to fluctuate across a much broader range, but it's going to wind up being more expensive. And ultimately you're not gonna, you're gonna wind up with problems with uh, like efficiency of the of the transmission winds up dropping. So there's there's give and take on every side. So it, it is a, it's just a multivariant, incredibly complex problem. And ultimately, like when, when we talk about fuel sources, like I think it's obvious nuclear power is the solution. And I, I I'm shocked that we're still talking about this, but, you know, nuclear power has become the Donald Trump of energy sources. Everybody's terrified of it and they have no idea why. And uh, they and so you've got you've got nuclear power, an incredibly dense power source that has an incredibly small footprint of, of negative waste. But its ultimate byproduct is hot water. That's, that's all it generates is hot water. So so, you know, it's a great place to go. But, you know, we're just not going there because, you know. We think wind is better and, and the pictures that you can put on your website of windmills are so compelling. And of course, government's throwing money at everybody to generate to to build windmills and build wind farms because they have to because they are having a hard time making them. So, well, there's, so there's pros and cons on all of that stuff. And I think yes. I, I do agree with you. I, a lot of people are not. The thing is, people are not aware of the negatives of, of wind energy versus the negatives of, Oh, Chernobyl, you know? Uh, so, so there's, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, I mean, there, there's one story that stands out, but they don't know anything about the environmental impact of devastating the bird population, but sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, like I said, there's pros and cons of it. And, and you basically approach the problems this same way of going, okay, we know that these are, these are potentials. These are, our preparations and what do we do to prepare for that you yeah. know and so and it's kind of bringing it back to this yes we we would have could have should have that's a whole other thing it'd be nice to have a big giant nuclear power plant way off somewhere in west texas where nobody's living or very few people right. are living instead of the windmills uh because right. it'll produce a whole lot more power and yada 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 but but yeah, yeah. We, like that. we, that's not where we're at no well, and there's, we had some conversations around, well, should we have told people or earlier, should, should there have been some kind of a notification that we could yeah, really get mad here? anyway? I mean, even if you tell them, they're still going to have, oh, no, you still can't do that. No, it, that's Fine. informing us. You, there's a science to when you inform the public about these kind of things happening. Uh, you know, because it's a, it's a lot of things. It's kind of like my internet goes down so many times. I've heard you like Comcast is down all the time. It's it, but they just don't broadcast what what it is. It just goes down for a few minutes and then it comes back up and you go, oh well, I don't know what happened. Well, it's working <laughs> now. You know, I mean, I don't need to know the details and the grits of them. And if I would, you know, com nobody would be buying Comcast. So right. it, it's about reliability is also a perception issue too. It is. And I mean, ultimately, what we could do and the way towards reliability ultimately has to do with taking what amounts to a sine curve, and that's our consumption, usually high in the daytime, usually low in the, in, in the nighttime and flattening that sucker out. So how do you do that? Well, you would have to start, uh, you'd have to start dictating to people when they could work, when they could do laundry, when they could run their fridge. I mean, at what price? N not in America. Stability, right? At what price? freedom or stability.
And and so there there are there's sort of considerations here. And so you know it's it's an interesting kind of commentary on how on how uh, what level of uh, what quality of life we want. And so there's not necessarily a tried and true answer. I think ultimately what we're going to wind up talking off a lot about is what do we have to do to winterize some of these assets? I think that that is a, a, a thing that's going to come up. It's going to raise the price of energy. You know, we're going to wind up with a little more cost there, but uh, if it saves some lives next time around, maybe something like that. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Like how would, how would you respond? What would you be looking at? I mean, you just hit the nail on the head. Yeah, I mean, I think just if you look at most energy or really any company today, uh, to not digitize, uh, especially if you're in a more physical, like operation, like work site, if that's kind of how you make and have revenue as a business, you've got to be able to, to digitize that and make that more smarter and, and run more efficiently. Yep. Like event-based architecture, being able to have, have, have things happen or predictive maintenance and monitoring where you can have insight into how things are, are performing. Like that's all going to require, uh, I think a, a pretty big shift in how we're used to doing things. Okay. Get, get some more information, get better prepared, be able to react. Right. I, I like what you had mentioned earlier about the incentive program for power companies, like kind of on standby, that if all of a sudden they're called in, because I, I, I would believe, I would like to believe that Houstonians, Texans are willing to pay a little bit more of a premium for emergency services in times like this to have there, because it's, it's kind of an added service, you know, I mean, not $16,000 for a single household, but you know, something reasonable that spread across the whole of the market but but having that option available kind of the the hail mary option of you know hey uh xyz energy company we need you to kick it in gear and we may have something that may not be as environmentally friendly but it's you know uh you have to have something as a backup portion to be able to cover that during inclement conditions that you, you know are coming. You know, there's a difference between a tornado that just spins out of nowhere. We saw this thing coming, you know, and so it would be able to have those kind of things on standby. Yeah, yeah that's but you have to, we have to we have to set up the incentives so that they they winterize or they can operate during the cold weather. You know, mm-hmm. I mean I think they were taking a gamble and saying, look, we're just gonna shut down if it gets below zero and mm-hmm. And, you know, that's okay with us, but, you know, it's not okay with the customer and, it, you know, at the, with the amount of downtime that they had, um, that should be, you know, there, there's no incentive for them to winterize their equipment and make their uh, power more reliable. I think that's something we'd have to address as well, make it incentivize, you know, or disincentivize uh, downtime and, and incentivize more uptime, I guess. This may be a dumb question, but it, like, why is ERCOT the only, like, what if we had a competitive ERCOT? Like, why are we only relying, like, and again, I don't know a whole lot about what I'm asking, but well, would I, that I think, incentivize like, them to treat and like do things a bit differently? Well, the, the ERCOT is a body that is essentially in the business to make sure that the energy is reliable. And that, that's not the case in all markets. In, in the Northeast markets, for instance, the entity that's in charge of that is uh, also in the business to make money, you know, or at least an arm of it is. So it's ERCOT is unique in that sense. And so ERCOT doesn't really own any of the assets. The assets are owned by other companies. The transmission lines are owned by other companies. ERCOT is just the the the, uh, the body that kind of helps govern that along with the public utility commission. So what if you if you listen to uh, like talk radio like I do, there's this guy named Michael Berry and he's just he's just redneck. He's great. But he he spent a lot of time in government. He talks about well what really happened is you've got all these these good old boys that that put their buddies in the, the PUC and ERCOT who have no idea what energy's about and 
they've now been exposed and those, those people are going to get found out and get silently pushed aside and replaced with people that have something have any idea what they're doing there's not really a way to put another ERCOT in there there yeah, theoretically might be, might be a way to put another grid together but that, well, that I think you be. just say, you kind of addressed it by saying i mean by mentioning what you're mentioning i mean because it always starts at the top it's always like it, mm. you know how it's a leadership problem and at the end of the day it's like when you put the right people in place a lot of things work themselves out yeah they can sure ERCOT seems to me to be more kind of in the family of a regulatory and compliance agency, that they make sure that the infrastructure is there, all the bits and pieces are there, all the checks are checked on with the checklist. And so you really can't have a lot of competition in something that's regulatory and compliance, because who's competing to be more compliant? You know, um, yeah, I guess so, I'm, I meant it more so in the sense of like, I'm not trying to criticize you. But that would incentivize them to, like, I guess, hold each other more accountable and, like, be, like, run to the best of their ability is kind of what I was getting at. It was just from an accountability standpoint, competition sometimes promotes and supports that. But I think that at the end of the day, it kind of goes back to who, who you're working with and who you're working for. When you get those things right, a lot of things kind of work out the way they need to. I think the difficult thing in this is people want a, a they want to point their finger somewhere, and ERCOT is the easiest one. And when I looked at this, and I was thinking, I don't even know if ERCOT is the one to blame for this. They happen to be the one that the egg finally flew and hit them in the face. But I, I don't see basically they're managing the ins and the outs and making sure, and they're making the decisions to say shut this off, otherwise bad things will happen. And so they get in trouble for making a decision that benefits everybody, but it's going to make everybody unhappy in doing that. So I don't see, I mean, that's kind of how I, I kind of see it. Well, it's my understanding that the, the asset owners are the people that shut it off and ERCOT can't make them essentially do that. They can punish them, uh, but they can't make them. The, the ERCOT, the ERCOT grid is unique in the United States. So, uh, that's why they're so proud of it. When you talk to the people uh, about the that work with ERCOT, they're really proud of it, and that's why the uh, some people are, are taking such joy out of mocking us in this particular problem because we did take quite a bit of uh, pride in something like this. So there, there's egg on our face. There's certainly egg on our face. Well, then, with that in mind, can we not have contractual obligations from the providers? So, so here's the thing: you you have a commitment, you have a contract. And if you just willy nilly go, you know what, we're just going to go ahead and turn our plants off because it's safer that way for us. And then they kind of leave Texans high and dry going, well, you're just going to get your power from somewhere. And so it's kind of like the the, the old good uh, Samaritan trick where somebody gets injured in the street and nobody helps them because they think somebody else is going to help them, not them. So, but if there's a contractual obligation that, look, you said you're going to provide this much power. You have a contractual obligation. You can't just turn this off. Otherwise, you're going to get penalized. So it's a balance yeah. between the penalties and the incentives that, I mean, because ultimately, we want the private industry to work. We want the private power providers to actually, to make a profit. We want them to do well, because if they right. do well, we all do well. Okay. Okay. I'm curious if anybody in the uh, in the chat here would say we need to connect ERCOT to the other grids because theoretically we could have pulled power from another neighboring grid if we didn't have enough power. Anybody would do that? I, I, I don't know enough to answer this, but I, like, why not? It sounds like a good idea. Okay, good. Yeah, have a take. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. What do you think, Matt? Muted. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, surprised to find that uh, Texas was the only, was on its own grid. There's the East Coast grid, there's the West Coast grid, and then there's just Texas. I thought <laughs> I thought that was is, is surprising, but but I think I heard somewhere somebody say somewhere there was no power to be found. I mean this this yeah, cold weather affected all of the South, and it wasn't like you know there was people with extra power just laying around 
you know, and they couldn't give it up. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have a stack of Imidron cubes just somewhere. Yeah, they're just like, oh, I've got these, I've got this power here. No, nobody's asking me for it. No, I don't think that was the situation. And and so, but I, I do think it should be connected. But um, I know Texas has a strong, you know, independence uh, kind of thing. And, and if they're, if they're proud of that, then, you know, great. But, you know, they've got egg on their face right now. We should hmm. figure out how to, how to make it better next time. And, and I don't know that connecting to another grid is, is going to do that, but it might uh, bring in more regulation and that's not always good too. So, you know, that's my opinion. Sorry. Okay. Right. I think you illustrated the risks and because the safeguards that are currently in place and uh, I, I don't think it would be a good idea to add potential risk for something that where the benefit may not like like what 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 Matt had said would would connecting to the other grids have solved our problem and I think the short answer is not really you know no. in fact it, it may have actually spread out the problem to even more people right there are people saying we needed to winterize the windmills we didn't winterize those I've heard it said that even if we had they still would have frozen up and so the, the, these are all simple solutions, but they don't really solve the problem. The problem is the problem is thorny as heck because power is everything right now. Maybe the problem is to find better sources of more reliable sources of heat. Ultimately, you can get by typically in the winter or in the summer if your AC goes out. It's not a whole lot of fun typically, but boy, when it gets br- brutal cold, that's a big problem. Maybe maybe we need to find better sources of heat. And shoot, the Texas ground is hot. I mean, it's hot most of the time. So maybe there's something to be said for heat pumps or something. But yeah, we gotta find a we gotta find a way to to change the way that we consume energy. Uh ultimately that's got we're gonna be going in that direction anyway. Uh some kind of renewable uh well, future. They, they have uh they have a lot of uh, wind turbines in, in Minnesota, and my understanding is they run year round. I don't think that would have solved our problem either because I think, mm. like you said, we don't make that much power from wind, and I don't think that it, it you know, is not, maybe not the good season for it. But uh, you know, I know that they have wind fields in Minnesota, and they run year round. It can be done, but you have to yep. you know, obviously pay extra for it or get you know get get the winterized version. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. I would imagine it's probably not as simple as that. What usually usually no. But it's uh, but but I think it's cool that everybody has kind of we're, we're all really grappling with the issues and we're not just saying, well, it's because of this or that. And the other thing you'll notice in polarized environments, gentlemen, that arguments and issues become very simple. That's that's when you know you're in a polarized environment. Boy, every discussion is simple all of a sudden, isn't it? <laughs> we're two masks. OK, so new ideas for 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 apps. Uh, I was talking to plumber plumbing dispatchers. And so we got a couple more minutes here in the meetup, but I've spent a lot of time talking to plumber plumbing dispatchers. And I can't believe we haven't solved this one yet. I mean, what, what's happening is everybody's getting on everybody's call list. I was listening to the owner of Abacus Plumbing. He said they had something like 40,000 phone calls in the past couple of days, uh, thousands of emails, thousands of texts, thousands of online bookings, just deluged uh, with uh, requests and stuff. And of course, the, all these people that would get a, re- a request in with them would go to 20 other places and put in requests. And so you've got these poor beleaguered dispatchers just drown- like every plumbing place I called, I'd go to voicemail and I'd say the bo- voicemail box is full. And I finally got through to somebody. They said, yeah, I was just in the voicemail box trying to clean stuff out. And so you, I would think there's an app for this, guys. There's got to be an app for these there- poor people. There is an infrastructure. If you like, I learned about this infrastructure, and it's like I don't know why this is not all over the place with all other service industries. If you call a um, a locksmith and you say I need a locksmith, I'm locked out of my house, and I need someone to come like now, you don't actually call the company. It actually goes to a dispatch company that has all these other companies that say, "Hey, look, I'm working. I'm working. I'm working. I'm working." And so they know who's working now. And so they're able to go, okay, well, we know who's out there. 
we're going to dispatch and send somebody out there to go get you taken care of. And they're there within 15 or 30 minutes. The same thing should and could and should exist for heating and air, plumbing. I mean, any other kind of service that says, hey, look, I'm a company. I'm on here. And then they could also develop ratings to mm -hmm. say that. And so you call this dispatch company or you, you plug in to this app and say, I'm looking for a four star or five star okay. uh, uh, right. a plumber uh, who's available now. Okay, or who's available next Tuesday, or you know, you fill in the gaps because most of the time, people when they, when people want that service, they don't want it next Tuesday. They they have a problem and they need it fixed now. You know, um, you know, disaster doesn't come on a schedule, but something like that most likely does exist. But it's in a proprietary. The locksmiths are using it. Yeah. Okay, but it's an entire system, and so it would take. The trick would be to get to build something like this, to have a company manage this and have to keep the politics nil, okay? Because there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. You got homeowner associations, all other kinds of garbage. But basically, present it as this: look, somebody's on staff, on service, and they need somebody, and they need somebody now. Let us know when you're out, when you're available, and we'll call you if you're available and they coordinate everything on behalf of the consumer. The consumer just says, Hey, look, I need somebody and I go, we'll get on it. And then they find somebody and they say, it's kind of like the concept like Uber for, yeah. uh, for, for service companies. Yeah. Of course we would be spending a lot of time and effort on the, uh, on the other side of the 80, 20 rule, right? We're trying to fix a problem that's happened once in 80 years. And so, well, it's while well, it's fixing, it's trying to deal with that one problem. It's inviting a whole new market and a whole new way of doing business. Well, right, that and I think the industry may or may not be open to. Well, I, I think, guys, I was talking to my boss today, and she was saying that, well, you know, I've got a son-in-law who's a plumber, and they don't like technology, or they wouldn't be plumbers, and so. There's a little bit of that to it as well, but I think there's this idea that, boy, we could have better, more efficient use of everything ultimately, and it'd be nice to be able to provide that, but boy, those poor beleaguered dispatchers, they they are absolutely flummoxed right now. And of course, you know, uh, the, the punchline there is, will we learn anything from this? You know, uh, within a month, we kind of go back to normal, right? I remember distinctly after Hurricane Harvey, we had to evacuate our house for Hurricane Harvey. We had some rising water. And I remember going with my daughter the day after we did, we demoed some houses in Cyprus that had been just flooded out. And I remember talking to her about it, how depressed she was the week after that, because we just went back to normal. You know, the Harvey, I don't know what happened with you guys and Harvey, if you were down here when that happened, but that was rough, man. That was scary. And within a week, we were right back to normal. Well, it was really rough for those people who uh, the the they opened the floodplains into the neighborhoods, yeah. and I have a, yep. a distant relative that that happened to. So it was not business as usual <laughs> after all that because yeah. they they lost. Their, I mean, can you imagine having standing water in your house for not days, weeks, and that was tough. Yeah. Well, I just think that, you know, baseball season starting and I can see everybody, ERCOT, what? You know, it's April. <laughs> you know, I, but we do. We have that situation. Like there, there were people on Twitter complaining and laughing, you know, complaining about ERCOT or whatever during a terrible, terrible winter storm. They were still able to get onto w Twitter and, and, you know, spread, you know, bad vibes man isn't that amazing i mean the 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 world that we've created is that incredibly successful so there's that idea of will we learn anything from this and will we have the uh will we have the ability to make that retrospective stick will we make ourselves accountable ultimately that's what we should be doing i think we will i mean i think uh the way that i've heard abbott talking is yeah we're going hmm. There's going to be action taken. There's going to be now whether that's good or bad is highly subjective, but yeah. I think 
we're going to definitely learn something from this and we are going to have takeaways and things are probably going to change a little bit. Yeah, I would think so. I think so. All right, gentlemen. Well, that is, that's been a great call. I appreciate your uh, participation. This was a total experiment. I didn't know how this would necessarily work out. Typically we'd like to keep more code oriented when we do DevOps to uh, meet up, but uh, in this we just instance, need to uh, dockerize it. Yeah. We, okay. A good point. We need to dockerize the entire grid. Uh, and running on Kubernetes because Kubernetes fixes everything. Apparently, I'm doing the uh, I'm doing the, I'm helping with DevOps Days Texas, and that happens next week. I think uh, virtual free DevOps Days Texas, two days worth of talks. Uh, and I was on the sessionized. You know, I'm reading all through all of the uh, sessions, and oh my gosh, it's like everybody thinks that Kubernetes solves everything. <laughs> Fifty the latest buzzword. Stuff. Latest <laughs> buzzword: microservices, <laughs> IoT. Let's do it. Uh, it is. Uh, oh. security, you got to say, say security. Come on, right. blockchain. Got to say blockchain. Uh, MLAI. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> ML and AI. Well, anyway, yeah, we've had quite a few uh, on the uh, last slide here. Quite a few things going on, and we are free. So, yeah, thanks for jumping on. Great, uh, great engagement. Appreciate, uh, appreciate you guys uh, helping me out and making this thing. Uh, happen. Keep an eye on our DevOps YouTube channel. I'll be posting this video by the end of the week. And uh, please take care and let me know if there's anything you need. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, you welcome. guys. Have a good, good evening. Talk. Yeah, good talk. Bye. I'll see you, see you all at DevOps Days. All right, cool.